Cool. Thanks, Mia. Uh, OK, so today we are reviewing a follow-up PR uh, from Casey uh, for the format feature. Uh, we had um, just completed, uh, as of yesterday, um, the format feature, um, which was a, a large feature uh, requiring months of work and many devs. Um, so congratulations to everybody who worked on that, um, uh, led by Charlie. Um, and uh, we had merged that because it was so large it had um, uh, impact on MSVC's um, internal files, um, which happens whenever we add new files, um, like a new header. Um, so to reduce risk, we got that merged early, but we've got this follow-up PR that's important. Um, so we want to merge this um, ideally today um, and then bundle them together and get them ported to 16.10 Preview 3. Um, so this is going to touch on a bunch of interesting areas that I have um, uh, struggled with for many years. So perhaps uh, Casey will be able to uh, enlighten me here. Um, this deals with uh, code pages and encodings um, and uh, locales, convert facts. Um, we've got interaction uh, with the import lib, which is how we need to add separately compiled things. Um, in theory, we actually don't need to add this to the import lib. We could inject it into the atomic weight DLL, um, uh, but uh, Casey's chosen the uh, import lib here. Um, and there's a couple fixes, um, one to parse precision um, and then a test improvement. Uh, OK, so let's see the motivation here. Um, so there's the notion if you look at. Let's see, I should have loaded this before. Um, where is the bookmarks? Here's the bookmarks. Uh, lexical conventions, uh, literal strings. I believe this is talks about the execution character set. Uh, that might actually be. That's going to be in the basic stuff. Um, nope, not I've that basic. Three. I've got three character three. sets. Spoilers. OK, thank you, Casey. <laughs> um, this is one of those super like, you know, fundamental things that I never think about. Um, OK, let's zoom in a bit. OK, so CS Plus has ideas, which I'm only moderately familiar with, of a basic uh, source character set, a source character set, an execution character set, and so forth. Um, my understanding is that the source character set is what you're literally typing into your source file. Um, the execution character set is how things like string literals are represented in memory. Um, so if you had, uh, for example, um, if you had the string Koshka in Russian, um, if your execution character set is UTF-8, then um, a care literal uh, with Koshka would have the UTF-8 encoding. Um, but if your um, execution character set were the um, uh, Russian code page, whatever that is, um, then you would have um, those um, uh, encodings for the individual letters, you know, uh, K and so forth, um, which are different than UTF-8, even though the source file would be identical. The source file could be UTF-8, it could be Russian or whatever. Um, so they, they're not necessarily the same. And then um, aside from the uh, encoding of the string literal in memory, um, the program at runtime can have, have an active code page. And this, I believe, corresponds potentially not exactly one to one, but somewhat closely with the user's locale um, and things like that. Uh, so that this is where format has apparently gotten into trouble, um, where it assumes that any strings it sees are in whatever code page the program is using at runtime um, instead of the um, uh, execution character set that the string literals were encoded in. Um, the, a lot of this, I believe, would be non-issues if the world were just completely UTF-8. Um, but we haven't quite gotten rid of code pages yet. Um, OK, so Casey is refactoring the format functionality um, into new class format codec. That's going to cache this convert vec thing from locales. Um, there's this new separately compiled function that will tell us how to convert things into the active code page. Um, and then reusing some of the machinery we had implemented for the file system ABI, and that's why it's being injected to the import lib there. Okay, so let's take a look at this. This has been um, 
uh, rebased onto main. Um, and uh, since this was originally targeted feature format, so I did that last night. Um, I've actually already viewed some of these files here. I'm actually going to uncheck that so I can take a look at everything fresh. Uh, let's see, I should just be alt clicking this. Listen to. Okay, so first off, we I've I've actually already verified um, as, uh, to accelerate things um, that we've got all the uh, the hack these files done. So one of the things we found is that if you ever have a process that you need to follow, like oh, if you go add a file, you need to go update files that mentioned in setup authoring, people will inevitably forget. And especially as it changes over time um, or things get renamed. In fact, we just had that happen. Um, so in our wiki, um, we've got what I think of as hack these files. It's called files to edit when adding or removing files. Um, so we just need to follow this whenever we you know, add or remove files, um, like this path just changed. So we updated that. So we have a single source of truth for this. Um, and I verified that on both the um, there's GitHub PR and our internal PR, all of this is being updated properly um, to add this new format CPP. We've got a special section when we inject stuff into the import lib, um, and this is being listed properly there. Um, the background there, quickly, if, I think I might have mentioned this the last time, um, but if you didn't see that review, um, we have the STL's DLL, msvcp140.dll, and the import lib, msvcprt.lib. Ordinarily, an import lib doesn't actually contain anything. It just contains, um, I think they're like stubs that tell the linker, hey, I don't have a definition of std get convert here, but you can get it from a DLL. Um, and I'll provide that DLL later. Um, so that's how the linker knows that the thing is not un, you know, unresolved external. But the idea of having an import lib is just sort of a convention. There's nothing actually stopping it from containing ordinary objects that provide actual function definitions. Uh, we refer to this as injecting ordinary objects into the import lib. Um, they're effectively statically linked. Uh, and that's what we have been increasingly doing um, to get around our ABI restriction of not being able to add exports once the ABI is frozen. Um, so in theory, we could actually add this to the atomic weight DLL because um, that's considered unlocked until we are totally, totally done with uh, CS plus 20. Um, but the import lib is also equally good. Um, it does have to obey some restrictions, like you can't add definitions of things whose layout and representation are variable, like depending on iterator debug level, because you only get two import libs, um, one for release and one for debug, but we support five different settings of iterator debug level. Um, so one of the first questions I asked Casey was, hey, does this format CPP have anything that's sensitive to IDL, like basic string or vector? And the answer is definitely not. So that's good. Um, so CMake list is being updated. That's on hack these files. Same with our MS build thing, same section. Um, the other technique I like to use is not just having the list of files, but also um, grepping. So if I'm, if I'm adding a new file, I'm going to search for something like you know shared mutex.cpp, find all the places it's currently mentioned, um, and then add the new thing alongside it. With the uh, headers, I like to search for bit set. Uh, for normal source files, I search for xrng dev because um, those are pretty unique identifiers. Um, so that's being properly edited. Uh, we've got a bunch of test changes. Um, let's see what's happening. X file system ABI. So here, this is a, a small header that defines sort of the flat C interface that our new CS17 file system implementation depends on. Um, here, Casey is adding an enumerator to std code page, but not changing anything existing. So this is totally ABI safe. Um, the std code page, we only had a constant for UTF-8. Now we're going to get underscore ACP, which is zero. I believe this means ANSI code page. Um, possibly active code page. Um, yeah, but the documentation goes back and forth between calling it active code page and ANSI code page. So, okay, awesome. So it's they're both, both the same thing as far as I know, and I don't know which one the abbreviation actually is intended yeah. to stand for. <laughs> so, and then there's like the OEM code page. I don't understand any of that stuff. Um, but zero is uh, what will indicate that. So that's good. Um, okay, why don't we look at format CPP before we get into the header? OK, so we got our copyright license. It's always good. Um, little banner comment implements a Win32 API wrapper for format. OK, we've got, as I requested in an earlier code review, what uh, what I think of as the scary comment. Um, this just explains what I talked about, where if you inject something like basic string into the import lib, you are super doomed. And um, someone asked on, on Discord, uh, it, it, did, did we learn this through experience? The answer is yes, we learned this through horrendous experience. I think it was like the VS, I want to say 2010 timeframe. Um, so this is a, a reminder to not ever do that again. 
Uh, we include X file system API. That's safe because it's very small and already included by import lib stuff. X look info H as well. Um, this does declare stuff. It doesn't actually instantiate any string stuff. Um, and we do include this in um, a similar import lib file. I think it's locale imp lib piece. That's safe. Um, we include the massive but not IDL sensitive windows.h. That's good. Um, now that Casey has dragged in windows.h, we can actually look at its CPACP macro and verify that this value, which is zero, um, when we initialize an enumerator with that value, is equal to std code base ACP. We can't put this in X file system ABIH itself because we can't drag in windows. Windows.h is enormous and enormously polluting, so we put it only into the source files. And this doesn't need a string literal or anything because um, we compile everything as C++ latest. OK, so now we're implementing one function, std get convert. That's the only function in this file. Um, it's extern C, so flat C interface. Uh, doesn't need template or any of that stuff. It is no discard because we wouldn't want to drop the error on the floor. It returns a std win error enum. This is an enum rather than like D word to make it type safe, uh, but it has the same value as the D word or H result get last error. Um, we use the std call calling convention for this stuff because it's slightly more efficient. Uh, our naming convention double underscore std get convert um, for flat C functions. It takes uh, by value a const code page and p convert is a const pointer to convert vec. Uh, we mark everything as no except so it's not sensitive to um, e the C part of EHSC. Um, so these things don't throw exceptions no matter what. Get conversion info for an arbitrary code page. <clears throat> okay, so we start off by um, resetting whatever p convert points to. Uh, and then first question, uh, and I do actually already know the answer to this, um, is whenever we call something that's separately compiled, we got to make sure that it's available on all the versions of Windows that we care about, um, or if not, that we know what we're doing, um, and that it's, uh, it's supported for store. So this goes back to Win2K, and it's supported for both desktop and UWP. So that's good. Uh, OK, so we initialize the CP info XW with empty braces to zero it out. Um, this API um, here takes the flags. Casey is being super explicit and saying, hey, you know, this takes something that's reserved. It must be zero. Um, so this is cool. Um, and we call it. We take this enum code page and static cast to uint using the Windows data type. Um, oh, if you've never seen this. Um, if you ever wonder like what these macros are, if you search for um, Windows data types and then thing, um, there's a page on MSDN uh, or Docs Microsoft, Microsoft Com that lists the most common types that you'll see. Um, so you can find out like exactly what it is. When you search near the bottom, there's a zillion occurrences. Here we go. Um, so the real type is actually just unsigned int because uh, there's a lot of types in Windows. Uh, OK, we passed the reserve flags, the address info. This is all separately compiled, so we don't need to care about address of. Um, let's look at the return value. So non-zero for success, zero for failure, and it can re uh, return error code through get less error. Error invalid parameter should be the only failure case. OK, so zero is failure. If it's zero, we failed. Uh, Casey's got no to bene. The only documented failure mode for get CP info XW is error invalid parameter. So in practice, you should never fail for CP ACP, we hope. Um, OK, so yeah, we return that as a stood win error. Otherwise, we've succeeded. We haven't acquired any resources or anything, so we don't need to worry about freeing something for failure or success, uh, success cases. Um, so in this convert vec, we grab the dot code page and the max care size. OK, uh, then we've got this loop that I don't fully understand. Um, for it is zero, less than max lead bytes plus equal two. So we're looking at pairs of bytes um, or pairs of elements. Um, if the lead byte of it is zero and the next one zero, then break. Um, so this API, which I'm relying on Casey to have thoroughly understood, um, uh, has this interesting pattern where it uh, ends with two null bytes. Where is that? It was mentioned here. Oh, maybe it was mentioned in the CP info X structure. Where did it go? 
Yeah, here we go. The array, this lead byte thing, uses two bytes to describe each range with two null bytes as a terminator after the last range. So that's what's being detected here. Uh, I don't need this. Okay. So this is when we find the end. Um, otherwise, we have a we can look at info lead by itx and info lead by itx plus one. Uh, this is not too verbose. If it were like super verbose, I'd ask for this to be centralized or stored in a couple const um, bytes. Um, but repeating it is fine. Uh, so we're going to iterate through all the bytes that are mentioned. This is the only time we use multi declarators in the STL conventionally. Um, so for each value, we go through p convert is lead byte. This is the bit that I don't understand. Um, Casey, since you're in this review, could you give us a summary of what this is? Um, I don't think we necessarily need a comment here, but it would be good to at least know what this is. That is lead byte is an array of 256 bits. One, one for each byte value that indicates whether or not that byte value could appear as the lead byte of a double byte code sequence in a okay. two byte encoding. That part makes so, sense to me, saying, yes. hey, if you see any of these bytes, you look it up at the table in constant time, we'll tell you if you could be or not. But why are we like shifting this byte by three and then um, oring because in some we, we need to go from byte values to bit numbers. Byte values to right. bit we're, we're, numbers. We're taking each value from this range of byte values yep. corresponds to a bit, right? And there are eight bits in, in each byte of this table that we're filling up. Oh, so, right? oh it's packed. To... This thing is not like a 256 table of right. unsigned cares. It's densely packed. It's a 32 table of unsigned yeah. cares. And okay, we use each bit within it, yes. OK, thanks. Uh, that's the part that I was missing. Um, which I would know if I had ever understood what this pconvert is, but what do I look like, an STL maintainer? Um, <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I agree that once you know that representation that this is pretty much self-explanatory. Um, so this grabs, um, yep, because it's eight bits to a byte, so that's why it's right shift three, and then this or is in, uh, let's see, at the byte, you look at the lower three bits, which is the part that you're essentially missing, and then, yeah, you turn on the right bit, and that's the or equal. Okay, this makes sense. Much less mysterious. Um, we could have a comment there, but um, I'm actually not sure. Does pconvert? I should just look in VS Code. Uh, go here. Come on. If we mention this um, in the definition of his lead byte, then I don't think there's a reason to keep mentioning it. Um, oh, and it looks like we, yeah, this, this pattern appears elsewhere. It's written slightly differently because we didn't have binary um, literals. Uh, yeah, okay. So this is, yeah, 32. It's got the common 256 bits. So the representation is is clear. Okay, no comment needed. Um, then if we get to the end here, we succeed. Okay, awesome. Uh, I have a question for this function. Yeah, sure. So what I was wondering about, we are, Starting resetting that p convert thing at the very beginning. Yes. So what I was wondering about, would it make sense to move that reset after the get cp info call? This way we could make it transactional. So if it fails, it doesn't modify any of its. Uh... Yes. Yeah, so that basically, is a, uh, that that is a good question. I. I um... Uh, it is often desirable for things to have transaction semantics. Um, in this case, uh, we're hoping that get CP info XW never actually fails if we give it proper parameters like a, a code page that's always valid, like CPACP, um, and a you know a non-null um, info pointer. Um, and the, uh, the the other consideration is. Um, do we need to provide uh, the transact, you know, transaction semantics, you know, either succeed completely or have no effect? Um, in this case, when we call it, um, we're not expecting to have any information in pconvert that we hope is isn't going to be damaged because if the thing succeeds, uh, succeeds, it's going to overwrite what's in pconvert. Um, so, 
I believe it's actually safer to say um, we're going to just you know wipe everything out here, and if it fails, um, somebody's not going to be confused. Like if they forget to check the error code um, by uh, stale information that was in the pconvert. Um, instead, if we zero everything out, um, if we look at the content of this again, um, like the page, the MP MB Kermax, Hopefully, somebody will notice that MB Kermax is zero, and that'll go you know. Uh, make other code misbehave in a very obvious manner rather than it seeming to work um, just because we had ignored failure. So I actually believe that, although it is um, it's a great question to whether we should provide transaction semantics, that the early clear idiom here is preferable. I see. Thank you. Cool. Um, yes, yeah, it's a great thing uh, to think about, like especially um, uh, for because we do want to delay things like that in things like vector where we need to provide transaction semantics or if we we can um, as a you know sort of strength and guarantee it's good. Uh, okay, so that's format CP. Uh, let's look at the rest of the product code as to ink format. This one is not as bad as it appears because I believe it's um, a lot of moving code around that just makes the diff look horrible. In fact, I think I may need to switch to side by side. Yeah, let's switch to side by side view here. Hide white space does not help. I've checked. OK, so format um, we will now drag in X file system ABI H for all that um, stood code page to Monero stuff. Uh, we declare the function. This matches the definition in extern C no discard macro. This one is different because in the source file we can always just say no discard. Um, still, when stood calls to get convert, uh, we take these things by non const value in the declarations to code page, code page, p convert, point of convert back, and it's always no accept. Okay, that's good. Um, these are being moved up. Um, we got these inline context for arrays with estimate low intervals. Um, this comes from format string stood. I guess we can take a quick look at this. Here we go. This was added um, one of the last papers to be applied to CS20. Um, this talks about estimating the width of a string as the sum of estimated widths of the first code points. Um, some stuff about extended graphene clusters um, and then ranges of code points where the estimated width is two. Um, the estimated width of other code points is one. Um, so these, I believe this is the narrow one. And then these ones are 20 bits. That's right, five hexads. So the width, est width estimate low intervals um, is essentially that information in the standard here represented as begin and pair. So like hex 1100, 1160, yeah, 1100, and then exclusive 1160. Um, so that's what's being encoded here. It's just a copy paste from the standard and then making it inclusive exclusive. Um, and we already had these there. These are just being moved around, so we've already reviewed their content. Um, same with the high intervals uh, with these larger constants. OK, that's all good. These are care 32 T's. OK, so we've got a I wish I could split the divider here or just see like after code. Um, that'd be nice. So this Unicode with estimate is called with um, a reference to one of these context expert arrays. So template on auto ref underscore bounds. Uh, it's no discard. It's a uh, context for int, even though I don't think we ever actually need the context for this yet. Uh, that's fine. Unicode with estimate takes a ch. This is a um, code point. Uh, and then it's no accept. Computes the width estimation for Unicode characters from N485. Yep, that's standard we just looked at. Um, OK, now that I've actually looked at the standard ease, um, I saw this toggling thing here. This toggles it to zero. Why is it switching between one and zero and not one and two? That's not what I want to look at. The, if you're in the range here, your width should be two. Anything else should be one. This starts off as one, and if you x or equal one, that's going to toggle you to zero. Um, for each bound, uh, 
yeah, if you're at the beginning, if you're less than bound return result. So essentially you start off one, so that's correct. Starting at one is correct. But once you're past this, we should be in the range two. That should really be X or equal two. It should actually be Zork three. Uh, oh, yes, you're right. Um, to toggle the two bit and the one bit both. The two bit and the one bit simultaneously. Yes. But in any case, yes, it's completely broken. Woo, I found a bug. And, Yay. And it indicates lack of test coverage. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. This is um, super broken and super not tested. Awesome. Yep, and this is actually um, code that was existing before, and I just glazed over it because I was like, okay, we're toggling between like one and zero. That must make sense. Um, and I hadn't looked at the standard ease, so looking at it again was useful. Uh, and then if we reach the end, return one. Uh, yes, because once you're past that range, we should be back to one. In theory, I think... Um, you could be actually just say return result as well. But this is just purely stylistic, so that's fine. OK, onward. Um, template on care T and a bool statically UTF-8. So there's this cool function that statement reply added um, that determines uh, at compile time if that execution care set used for string literals is UTF-8 by just inspecting a string literal um, and saying, hey, does this correspond to the bytes that we expect out of UTF-8? So, uh, that's a cool uh, technique. Um, so we got this format codec, um, and then we've got a format codec base that's templated only on whether we're statically UTF-8. If we are, we do nothing, um, following our conventional preference to have the primary template be the true form. Um, yeah. Cameron has his hand raised. I know you can't see the Teams window very easily when you're on this. Oh, machine. yes, I can't. I can't see the Teams window at all. Um, go, Cameron. Oh, okay. Um, in the previous function, I'm kind of curious. Like, is that the kind of is that the kind of thing where you could just turn that into a binary search as opposed to a linear search? Um, the weird on off on off thing would not work well. You would need a binary search that jumped every two. If this were organized as an array of pairs, then it could absolutely be a binary search. Um, in this case, it's short enough that I think a binary search would not help in terms of performance. Um, it actually it can be a little bit less code um, uh, just to write it, because the binary search can give you the answer, um, you know, are you in or out of this? In this case, it's actually because we're denoting it as these regions that are two and anything outside is one. We actually can't just use std binary search. I think it would need to be std lower bound. Um, I think it would actually end up being more code if we used a binary search. But if there was like a zillion, zillion intervals, then yes, that would be an excellent suggestion. Um, I had found in, uh, it was CareConf, that we had a table of um, something I was looking up. Um, and uh, it depend, um, depending on the inputs the user gave, the number of things that we needed to search through could range anywhere from like one or a handful up to several hundreds. Um, and I actually profiled because every nanosecond mattered of uh, how long a linear search versus binary search took. And the crossover was around like 170. The linear search was much faster until the number got way larger. In fact, I can I can dig that up. Um, that was, oh, I don't want control shift P, no. Uh, care, I think it was an actual care conf. Um, did I use lower bound? Uh, yes. Here we go. Um, so we've got this uh, special table that's constructed. Um, and then depending on the user, it was a user precision. Um, uh, the threshold was 155. So I found that, um, that I prepared this cool like graph in Excel. Um, the linear search, and it was sorted and everything, um, the linear search is faster until the number of elements we were looking at was over 155. Um, then we'll switch over to lower bound. Um, so for the um, uh, small table that Casey's searching through, I believe a linear search will be ideal um, in terms of performance. The Because everything's cached, we don't need to have these accesses that um, bounce around in the array, which are somewhat hostile to caching. 
Um, and here the primary consideration is what's lots code. And I think that this um, linear search is fairly low code, although you could imagine other organizations that um, could maybe save a line or two, but it would be a more significant refactor. Yeah, cool, thanks. Cool. Um, okay. Uh, so, oh, and uh, I guess one other thing since you brought it up. Um, here we use a lower bound um, to look for like a specific value because um, we want to know where was it um, and then go do math on what we find there. Um, but if you just want to know, um, does this thing exist or not? Um, actually, it's not in this. No, it is It is in the repo. It's in um, validate. It's just in the tool subdirectory. Um, sometimes you have a sorted table. Let me find it um, here. Um, so you can have, here we have a sorted table of um, extensions. We want to know, hey, you know, is a, does a file have one of these extensions? Um, so after static asserting that this table sorted, um, we can do a binary search, but because we don't need to know like what is actually contained in here, we just want a yes, no answer. Um, we can use the actual std binary search algorithm, which returns a bool. Um, so you can search in that array and then give it the extension. It'll say, yes, you're in the array or not. Um, so this is the most convenient when it works. Uh, okay, so we got from a codec base. If we're not statically UTF-8, then we got to do extra work. Um, protected. We've got one of these convert vex named convert as a data member. Uh, we've got a member function that returns a no discard int, double byte encoding, code units in next character, taking const ranges first and last, it's const. Returns a count of the number of code units that compose the first encoded character in first last, inclusive, exclusive, or a negative one if first last doesn't contain an entire coded character or DR first is not, not a valid lead byte. So according to my understanding, this is what's going to allow us to step through the format string um, and consume actual encoded characters and not just individual bytes. Um, the terminology is that a code, and this is Unicode terminology that also is useful for non-Unicode encodings, um, a code unit is the sort of conceptual notion of a character like here in this, um, uh, these are uh, ranges like this 1F900. This is a code, um, sorry, this is a code point. Um, a code unit is the uh, actual thing that's stored um, in, for like UTF-16, a code unit is a WKRT, but a code point might be composed of two WKRTs. Um, so the terminology is uh, very important not get confused between code unit and code point. Um, and I may misspeak because it is so easy to get confused, but this usage here is correct in the code. Uh, okay, so WKRT wide, multibyte state T, ST, and we zero that out. Um, we subtract the pointers. These are pointers to carers. Um, that's going to be putter of T, so we static cast to size T, stores len. We call multi-byte range to wide character. Fill in the wide character. Give it the first and len. And then we need to give it this MB state T, which records like if we're in the middle of parsing a um, multi-byte character and this convert vec, which uh, tells it how to parse. Uh, we get the result out and then um, its return values here, I guess we could look at, because this is an ST internal function. Yeah, XLOG info H. Where do we define this puppy? Okay. Oh, it's declared here and then it's defined in X MB to WC. That's it. B. Yeah, here we go. Um, return zero if the pointer is to a null character, um, or if DRFS is a null character that looked like pointers. Um, negative one. If the next n or fewer bytes is not availed, multiply character, negative two, partial conversion, otherwise the number of bytes. Okay, says so that right here. <clears throat> Sorry about the small screen. Um, okay, so if the result is positive, yep, number of bytes, return it. Um, otherwise, if it's not positive, then if it's negative, invalid or incomplete, yep, negative one. Um, otherwise, Yep, if we're looking at a null character, then one. 
Uh, that's what we're returning one. Okay, so that's good. Yeah, because the null character is just one um, code unit. Okay, so we have a constructor. Then we've got this um, interesting, although not quite unprecedented test hook. Um, if nobody is defined underscore format code page, then we'll default, which is what users will use the ACP, but test code can override this. Um, okay. And this is why is this maybe unused? It's because we don't use it um, when a internal check is not defined. So we call std get convert with the format code page, which is usually ACP. Um, we give it the convert vec in our data member to initialize it. Um, and yeah, here we're in a constructor and convert vec actually contains garbage. So there's no reason not to initially um, just zero it out um, within std get convert. Uh, we look at the results um, when we are in our own tests and we verify that it's success, but for user code, we expect it's always success. We're not gonna emit a check. And then we undef the macro to be clean. Okay, that's good. Um, so now this, um, uh, primary template. Why did we need to forward declare this? Did we mention it? Base, base, base. This is specifically for care. Um, in theory, this um, primary, this declaration of the primary template could be moved down to keep it here. Um, it's stylistic. It doesn't really matter. I'm not going to add a comment. Um, here, this this way, it's a little clearer to say, hey, we're going to define format codec, but first, we need to define format codec base. Um, so there's an argument for the way that Casey got it. So I'm happy. Um, template, like if it was a zillion, zillion pages of code, I might ask for it to move, move down, but this is just one class definition, really. Uh, template bool, are we statically UTF-8? Um, if our character type is care, um, we're going to derive privately from this format codec base that may contain this convert vec, otherwise might contain nothing. Um, then we've got some private member functions. So no discard static const expert int UTF-8 code units next character. Um, this is if we don't know if we're statically UTF-8. Oh no, this is we're going to specialize for false later, aren't we? Let me scroll down. It's a little sneakier than that. There's this one is for used for care whether we're statically UTF-8 or not. Oh, interesting. But all of the UTF-8 stuff is there. It just doesn't get called. There's if const expert in the public APIs. Oh, I see. That's so, but that stuff is there, but unused if we're not statically UTF-8. Uh, actually, I'm sorry. This is actually used in both cases. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so this always looks at UTF-8. Okay, that's a little interesting. Um, thanks for explaining. Uh, okay, it takes the totally const range. It's no accepts. Uh, returns a count to the number of UTF-8 code units that compose the first encoded character in first last, or negative one if it doesn't contain an entire coded character, or dear first is not a valid lead byte. Um, so this is uh, following the rules of UTF-8, which I'm somewhat familiar with, having implemented this for file system. Um, if not, Wikipedia is uh, very useful. Um, Consado is is dear first is a care static has to unsigned care. If you are within the range that's just a single byte, then just return one. Um, otherwise, get the number of characters, len. Um, and why does that need to be? This doesn't really need to be static cast. We're not passing it to anything else. We compare it against constants. We could just use put of t. Um, but size t is good too. Kind of everything should be size t. Um, that's fine. Uh, if the ch is within this uh, range that it could be two bytes, um, then check for non-lead byte or partial two-byte encoded character. Um, return, okay, so if the ch is in this valid range and we have enough bytes, if the length is greater or equal to, then it's going to be two bytes. Otherwise, either we... Um, are not a lead byte. That's that sort of middle range here. Uh, I would be looking this up in Wikipedia, except I remember how this works. Um, or um, if we don't have enough characters remaining, then return negative one. So that looks good. Um, similar technique here for three byte sequences. 
And then otherwise, we've got a four byte sequence. OK, that looks good. <clears throat> um, estimate UTF-8 character width. No discard, static int, OK. Putter in units. Return an estimate for the width character composed of units, code units, whose first code unit is denoted by putter. OK, so that care. Going to store it as a care 32T um, and then start. Uh, looking at its bits. It's interesting. Um, oh, because we're masking away. I was like, are we masking or are we weren't? OK, so we look at the ch, we switch on the number of units. If it's one or two, we return one because um, the width can only be one because uh, the, the one and two byte characters are all outside of this um, range here, basically. For three and four, we need to do actual work. Um, so we uh, look at the lower bits because in UTF-8, um, the lower bits provide the actual information. The higher bits say what range they're in, basically. Um, OK, so that's good. And then for the remaining, and we've got to break after every case, which is our style. Uh, so as we maintain code, we're not going to um, damage stuff by putting cases at the end. Then we consume the remaining number of units. We've already consumed one, so we start at one. And then less than units. Uh, we make room for the additional bits. It's six bits every time. Yeah, for the follow-up characters. OK. Um, if we only consume three units, use those lower intervals, otherwise high. Because at this point, it can only be three and four. OK, so that's good. Uh, public, notice card units next character. So this could handle the non-UTFA case. First and last, we're going to iterate these. We are not. These could actually be top level const. Oh, that is a suggestion. I'd like const. Um, uh, looks like uh, these could be top level const. And the member function is const no accept. It does look at a data member, so it can't be static. Turns account to the number of code units that compose the first code character in first last. OK, yeah, same sort of comment. Uh, we have an internal check, which is active only for our tests, that the range is valid first less than strictly less than last. So we need at least a byte. Um, so if we're being told that we're statically UTF-8, call the UTF-8 function. Otherwise, switch on the multibyte max in the convert vec. Um, for any unknown value, we're going to have an internal check in our test. Whoa, bad number of encoding units. Um, but we'll fall through um, in user code to just return one. We don't expect that to ever happen. Um, if we could look at two bytes and we're not statically UTF-8, then call this um, double byte encoding code units from a base class. We need this arrow. Um, for four bytes, um, then we assume it's UTF-8. Um, it wasn't statically UTF-8, but it's UTF-8 uh, at runtime. Uh, OK, that's good. And everything ends with a return. OK, so that's good. We got the default there. That follows through. OK, find encoded in a range. Uh, first, last, and a const care val. It's no discard, turns const care star. Turns the first currency val as an encoded character and not, for example, as a continuation byte and first last. OK, so for statically UTF-8, then we know we're never going to be deceived. The cool thing about um, UTF-8 is that um, the continuation bytes, as Casey calls them, um, occupy completely distinct ranges from the bytes that stand alone. Um, so if you're looking for just a plain care, like a percent, you'll never be confused by uh, second, third, or fourth byte. So we can just call the STL algorithm find and check. But if we're not statically UTF-8, uh, we need to do some runtime testing. Um, if the MB curve max is one, then it's just a single byte encoding. Um, so we can just do a find and check. Um, or if the MB curve max is four, we assume it's UTF-8. Nice comment there. Um, so we can just return find and check. Otherwise, we're looking at MB curve max of two, so we need to do actual work. Uh, we iterate through the range as long as we haven't hit the end and we have not found the character we're looking for. Call units and next character to say, OK, we're looking at some bytes. 
how many of those bytes do we need to consume? Units will tell us. If that's less than zero, that's super bad. We use our throw macro to throw invalid encoded character and format string. Okay. And then because we're not looking at the val, um, we need to step forward by the number of units that we just found. So first plus equal units. Um, and then we'll repeat. We'll see if we hit the end. We'll see if we're looking at the val. So that's good. Um, when we get here, either we hit the end or we um, are looking at the character where we want like percent or D or whatever, our close brace. So we return that. Uh, estimate with, no discard, int estimate with, const first star, const putter, constant units, return an estimate for the with character composed of units, code units, whose first code units can know by putter. Okay, so if we're statically UTF-8, call the UTF-8 function. Otherwise, um, if we are not four, then it's not Unicode. Uh, we estimate with is number of code units. So if we're looking at a three byte, in, or sorry, a two byte encoded character, we're going to estimate two. Um, I guess this is. The width is unspecified, so we can do whatever we want, and it seems like a reasonable heuristic. Um, assume UTF-8, if it is for, this is a little weird um, stylistically, like we could reverse this at the equality test comes first, but it's really the same either way. It, there's no lot, there's not really more co complex, and we've got the comment already here, so that's fine. Um, okay, so now if we're looking at WKRTs, this is the specialization. WKRTs, uh, no discard it, units, next character. We're looking at const WKRT range. Uh, returns a count of the number of code units that compose the first code of character. This is a little bit different now. Or if you are first as an unpaired surrogate, because if we're, look, if we're looking at WKRTs, we have to worry about surrogate pairs. Um, so it's nice that emoji like now mean that we really need to handle surrogate pairs correctly. It used to be, oh, surrogate pairs, you know, those are like super obscure. Uh, but now emoji are a great test case. Um, Eston turn check, first lesson last. Okay, range got to be valid. Uh, okay, so if you're outside of these ranges, which I recognize from UTF 16, return one. Um, unpaired low surrogate, that's bad, negative one. Okay, so we know we are looking at strictly, it's a strict range, so we're looking at at least one character. So we can always increment first, but that might have been our only character, so we need to worry about what if that hit last. Um, so if we had only one character um, at this point, um, or if the follow-up character, because we've already incremented it, is outside this range, then we've got an unpaired high surrogate. Okay, otherwise we'll turn two. Uh, this is fine. It's a little, it's a little complicated. We usually uh, try to avoid really complicated expressions that have side effects in the STL. Um, uh, it's sort of a stylistic thing, and our code base has definitely changed. Older code used to be um, very fond of doing lots and lots of side effects. Um, here, this reads straightforward. It's like, okay, we're going to consume that character, and then just start looking at first now that it's been advanced. Um, so I don't worry about having to split this up into separate tests or anything. Okay, so that's good. Uh, fine encoded. If we're looking at WKRTs, and what we're looking for. Oh, find encoded. Yeah, find an encoded WKRT. Um, here, because the way surrogate pairs work, we don't need to worry about like follow-up bytes. They do occupy distinct ranges. Um, so we can just always call find and checked, which is just the classic find algorithm, linear find. Uh, estimate with, no discard in, takes const WKRT star const putter, constant units. Okay, same sort of comment. Uh, okay, so we read it as a care 32 t if we're looking at just one unit, then it's got to be in this low interval, the ones that occupy a single 16-bit um, range. Um, otherwise, we're looking at a surrogate pair. So extract the information from the first character we're looking at, um, get the second character, and add in the information. Yep, this is the UTF-16 algorithm. And then look at the high intervals. OK, good. Uh, OK, parcel lines. This is where we're looking for characters. Um, question for Casey. Uh, does the chrono parse stuff need this enlightenment? Um, there's one place I think that it did that I hooked it in. Oh, okay, cool. In, in I, the, I, whatever, in the earlier PR, obviously not, not in this PR. 
Ah, okay, so it's already going through this stuff. If that's okay. true, then why didn't I touch it in this PR? And I need to double check. Okay, that's yeah, the gonna be my final response. Okay. The <laughs> I need to audit Chrono for dangerous. occurrences of plus one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there, there are plus ones in the chrono code where we step past um, like braces, um, but we're not 100% sure what's going on there. Um, it, yeah, it maybe the we'll specific watch. problem case is when you use plus one to skip over an unknown character. Ah, uh, if okay. you're skipping over a known ASCII character, then plus one is fine. Oh, but skipping one. over an unknown character with plus one is, is the no-no that breaks things. Yeah. Okay, we do consume lit, literal characters, lit cares, um, in the chrono stuff. So that might be affected. Um, okay, why don't we add um, why don't we add a card for this? Um, should it be to do before merge or just to do? It can be just plain to do. Um, uh, what yeah. do you call this? Uh, active code page. Um, actually, it's uh, 1834. Um, see whether um, 1834. Uh, needs to be um, applied or needs similar changes. Uh, see whether similar changes to number 1834 are necessary for for Chrono. Fun fact, I once lost a spelling bee because I couldn't spell necessary from memory um, out loud. I've, if I were writing it down, I would have got it right. But when I say it out loud, I screwed up. Um, OK. Yes, Casey. Uh, onward. So we make a temporary object of that format codec type. Um, when we're parsed the line, and we have no real way to cache this. We're not storing this anywhere because we're just parsing it once, really. Um, yep, can't do any better than this. Uh, Mutes next character. Okay. And then the rest of the codes have changed. Okay. Uh, parse format string. We have a const format codec named codec. We can call these fine encoded because now this is stateful rather than just a um, being purely driven through this uh, convert vec thing. Okay. Lots of code being moved. Uh, okay, down here, uh, measure string prefix. Uh, const format codec codec. Still got a to do about extended graphing clustering, but this is being updated. OK. And that's the product code. OK, cool. Uh, so now we got test code. And I think we can go back to unified diff. OK, so in our test directory, we've got a common um, header, test format support. Um, let's see. This is the test parse helper. So we try to call the func on a range in a basic string view. And then previously we said if we had an expected end position, if it's not in pause, then inspect the value that we just got. Otherwise, don't inspect it at all. Um, this is now being changed to be a stricter check. Um, if the expected end position that the user gave us where the user is us, um, is equal to nPause, then provide a default that it should we should expect to get view size returned. And then no matter what, assert that the end that we got is equal to the view data plus expected end position. OK, makes sense. So in the case that the user gives us nPause, we actually now validate the end equals view data plus view size. So strictly stronger. Uh, OK, test. Change in text formatting formatting. We're lifting out this test multibyte format strings. OK, so that's good. The content is being superseded. Uh, we've got changes to legacy text encoding. Let me skip that for now. Um, similar change to text formatting parsing. Uh, let's see here. This was passing n pause. Now it's going to pass 0. Why is this? Okay, so we're looking at character where the least significant byte is the same as ASCII close angle because it looks like an alignment, like line right or whatever. We used to get end and now we get zero. 
because we're now properly handling it. Is that we didn't right? used to get in. We used to not care. It's, it's right. In pause used to mean I don't oh, care. Oh, don't care. Yeah, but now now we care. <laughs> and and that, that was a mistake it. because that hit a bug. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, and then otherwise, yeah, this is also being lifted out, so that's good. Okay. Um, here in the UTFA test CPP, we're going to define that override before we include any headers. Um, this will be a challenge if we ever try to make this use header hits, but when we're in classic includes, go for it. Um, define format code page to be std code page UTF-8. Uh, it's good, doesn't need parentheses or anything. Okay, so now we're down to the last test file. Legacy test encoding. Why does this one need parentheses though? Um, Oh, it's because it was being wrapped. Um, OK, because it's got those braces. Uh, so define the format code page to be std code page 932, which is the uh, shift gis code page. Um, and then all this, oh, we need side by side. Yeah, instead of having a brace and then setting locale, um, we are relying on this to provide the code page 932, but otherwise the content here is the same. Actually, I think, um, hold on, if I think if I ignore white space, this will be better. Uh, marginally better. Um, okay. Oh, it's because it was unwrapping as well. That's what's happening here. Okay, so the test content is the same. This is just being unwrapped onto a single line. Um, this parcel line phone can now be const because we're not going to modify it or anything. Uh, in fact, I think it always could have been const. Um, and then here I had asked, hey, what's up with this uh, comment? And that's causing claim format to wrap. Um, I like that it's being wrapped, so thanks, Casey. Uh, OK, so this test is otherwise unchanged. And we don't need to like set the locale to shift gis and then go set back to C. It's all being handled by the uh, format code page there. Uh, okay. Well, that in set locale doesn't affect anything in format anymore, right? Because of this right. change. <laughs> yeah. And that's, I guess that's good um, that we're not sensitive to set locale anymore. Uh, okay, so uh, the issues we found were uh, missing top level const and totally broken code. Um, so I'm going to call that a success. Uh, I will request changes and then we can get this revised, get the revision ported to the MSVCPR and Hopefully get this checked in. Uh, okay, so I believe that's it for our video code review. Does anybody have uh, questions about all the cool stuff uh, that we looked at? Locales are so fun. Um, I've I've tried so hard over over the years to like under really understand like how locales work and I I think um I think I understand like the idea of code pages and encodings pretty well now um but the actual machinery that we have of like locales and facets it slips through my my brain every time I try to wrap my head around it um yeah, I can still well, you know oh yeah go ahead yeah one problem is that like there's structurally no way for us to actually not be broken in execution char sets that aren't UTF-8, right? Because like basically what we say is like, if you set your execution char set to something and then run on a computer with a different code page, everything will just explode, which is right, indeed what happens. Yeah. yeah, which is indeed what happens if you run like, um, you know, a lot of like Japanese software will have you know, we'll use shift just for everything and it just explodes if you don't change your code page. Like mm -hmm. it just like random, like you'll just get a random seg fault some, somewhere, or like some error will get thrown. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, it's kind of, uh, yeah, these, these various shift encodings are not great. And I'm glad that uh, they, like people were like, no, we're not going to do this. We're just going to use UTF for everything. Yes, UTF everywhere. I guess there's UTF one, which is an oddball encoding, but nobody uses that. So. Okay, so it sounds like we have uh, no other questions. So thanks everyone.
Did anybody push the record button? Yes, Mia pushed the record button. Never mind. I did. I remember now. Okay. See ya. <laughs> cool. See ya, everyone. <laughs>